Today is the review of the semester. Uh, before I do that, a couple logistical things. I'll, I'll remind you that the final exam is a week from Saturday, December 14th, 9 o'clock here. Bring a pencil. What else? Take the old exams, learn from them. It's 60 multiple choice questions, uh, same as usual. Uh, three hours, the three hours that are allotted for take at 9 to 12 is sort of an infinite amount of time. So, so you should all know when to stop taking the exam. The only people here at noon are the people who, who overslept and showed up at like 11. <laughs> it happens pretty much every year. Or, oh, I thought it was the afternoon. Okay, so, so that's that. Uh, about the problem set, the deal, I drop your lowest problem set if you complete the course evaluation online. It's on Colab. So you log into Colab. Uh, you don't have to go to the, cl the cl class itself. You go, that entry page, once you've logged in, has course evaluations on it. And you can find the course evaluation for this and all your other classes. The, this course evaluation uh, is the deadline for it's December 8th. So uh, Sunday night at 11.59. Don't miss it. I can't change it. Once you missed it, it's missed. Okay, the deal goes away. Any other logistical questions about the class? I'll be in my office hours Monday and Wednesday as usual. All right, so um, one question that came, uh, just to respond to someone's question from last time about, I told you about the, the, Earth, the Earth and the Moon are actually orbiting each other. In fact, they're orbiting their, their combined center of mass, just for fun. I, I believe that combined center of mass is actually still within the Earth. It's just not the center of the Earth. I don't know exactly, because the, the Moon's got so much, so, little, so much less mass than the Earth does. But someone asked about the Lagrange points. It, the Lagrange points are a complicated story that, that I, I'm not good at anymore. I haven't studied them for years. There are dynamic stable equilibrium that's, that's uh, interesting, but, but beyond what we can do here. All right, so, so then just to look at the semester. So um, I will try to go vaguely even coverage, but so what are the key points? And this is, to some extent, this is the key physics issues within the topics things that, that I hope you'll take with you. Uh, so I can focus on the topics, but, but I'll end up thinking more about the, the, the physics, and it may jump between topics. So with skating, the, 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 the key things that showed up in skating are the idea of inertia, that contrary to common experience, forces, I mean, th things tend to do what they are doing in the terms of their motion. If they're motionless, they stay that way. Uh, if they're moving, they tend to move steadily. Straight lines, steady pace. And what that means then is that, that forces don't cause motion. Motion comes about often because of inertia. What forces do is they cause changes in the motion. So an object that's moving to your right at whatever speed, uh, it will keep doing that steadily if nothing pushes on it. That's the nature of things in our universe. They have inertia. Uh, more, later on, we discovered that the name for that really is momentum. So an object that's moving steadily, that nothing's pushing on, is, has momentum. It has to keep moving. And your forces don't cause the motion. They cause the change in the motion. So you can push on it. When you push on an object, you change this steady motion. It either slows, up, slows down, speeds up, or it changes the direction in which it's traveling, some combination of those. So uh, that, that then reappeared over and over again throughout the semester, the idea that things have have inertia that forces, and bottom line, forces cause accelerations. They don't cause velocity. Um, forces, the, the acceleration that a force, exer that force causes, it's proportional to force and inversely proportional to the mass of the object. So if an object is, is experiencing suddenly twice the force as before, it's going to accelerate twice as fast. Uh, if you push equally hard on two objects, one of which is twice as massive as the other, the more massive one's going to accelerate half as fast, stuff like that. So, so among the few sort of quantitative, formulaic things I hope you, you will remember, and I feel comfortable asking about on the test, is, is that Newton's second law, the idea that, that forces cause accelerations, masses resist accelerations. And if you know the force, the, the net force acting on an object, and you know its mass, you divide one by the other, and you get the acceleration. All right. Um, looking at falling balls, this is the first force, gravity. Uh, it turns out 
that gravity here on the surface of the Earth, uh, the Earth's gravity exerts a force on all of us, all the objects, and that force, uh, amazingly enough or whatever, uh, is proportional to the mass of the object. So objects develop weight here. That's the force due to gravity. And the weight is proportional to their mass. You can one could imagine a universe in which that wasn't true. But it's true in our universe. And so we kind of use mass and weight almost in, uh, indistinguishably in, in, our, in, in common existence. They're different quantities. And, and it's worth remembering to keep them apart. A kilogram is a unit of mass. So a kilogram of flour, that's how hard it is to accelerate, to make it go from motionless to, to moving at one meter per second. Um, weight is a gravity issue. It's how hard the Earth's gravity is pulling on it. They go together. But if you take that one kilogram of flour to some distant planet, it's still going to be a kilogram of mass, because that's intrinsic to the object, how hard it is to accelerate. But its weight, who knows? Depends on the planet, where you are. OK? Um, ramps. Uh, in, in the context of ramps, I look at another force, support forces that, that, that objects exert on each other uh, to keep each other from uh, occupying the same space. They push each other apart. And those, so those forces are always exactly perpendicular surfaces. Um, so when you sit something on a sidewalk, it doesn't fall through easily. It, they're, they're pushing each other apart. And tipping the, side, tipping the sidewalk created this imperfect balance between, between uh, the support force up-ish and gravity down. And you ended up with an overall downhill ramp force that makes things accelerate downhill. So this is when you go skiing next time. On downhill skiing, you're, you know, what's propelling you downhill? It, you, you, you got a leftover between the support force from the, from the mountain and the gravity down, and you accelerate downhill. Uh, another important issue that came up, though, in the context of ramps was energy. Uh, it the, was the first of our conserved quantities. The, the next two were momentum and angular momentum. Energy is a conserved quantity. That's the reason why it's interesting to scientists. And, often, and, and uh, finally, everyday life, energy matters. Um, it is just a quantity. It has no direction. It's just an amount. How much energy do you have? And you can't change your energy without giving it or exchanging it to other, with, with something else. So energy uh, can be passed from one object to the other. In the early days, we talked about it being passed only mechanically. You can pass energy by doing work on something. So I can you know, ha have, have a few toys to play with. I can put energy into this, the ball by exerting a force on it and having it move a distance in the direction of that force. That was the rule. So I can push on it. Pushing isn't enough. It has to move a distance in the direction of my force. And then I've given it energy. So I've lost some. It's gained some. Uh, between the two of us, we still have the same energy. It's just been distributed differently. All right. Later on, we discovered that you can transfer energy another way, and that's thermal energy. If you're hotter than something else, and you touch it, higher temperature than something else, and you touch it, heat will flow from you to it, and that heat is thermal energy on the move. You're losing energy, it's gaining energy. So the equivalence of, of heat and work, as far as being energy, is the, uh, the law of thermal, the law of conservation of energy, which is part of the laws of thermodynamics, which we'll encounter later on. All right. Um, I talked in, the, in seesaws about just rotational issues. Um, oh, before I leave work, work is one of the other sort of calculational things that I hope you will remember how to do. Remember, it's a force. The force you exert on something times the distance it moves in the direction of your force. You can actually calculate how much energy you give something. Um, I probably wouldn't do it down to, down to giving you a, a value of 10 units. But, but, but you should know when you're doing positive work, when you're doing negative work, which is having it move the wrong way, or when you're doing zero work. OK. Uh, seesaws, rotation, the world of rotation, very similar to the world of translation. Um, nothing stands out as crucially important there. Um, in, in wheels. I looked at friction. Friction, the force of, it's another force in, in, in our toolkit. The forces of friction occur between two surfaces, but unlike support forces, which push the surfaces away from each other, perpendicular to their surfaces, 
Frictional forces are exerted parallel to the surfaces, along them, and they fight relative motion. And I should mention also that the, the, these forces, they always show up in pairs, right? Newton's third law says so, uh, observes that, that case. But when you try to, to have two things slide across each other, the frictional forces fight that relative motion, try to bring them both to the same velocity. Um, bumper cars I talked about, um, the, the, two conserve, the two more conserved quantities in nature that, that are important this semester. Um, one of them is momentum, and one of them is angular momentum. The, the momentum is the, phys the conserved quantity of, of going somewhere, it's of moving. And so it has a direction. It's an amount and a direction. Direction matters. And we go through life. Uh, if you've got momentum, you have to keep moving um, until, you give, until you exchange momentum with something else. And those exchanges of momentum, because there's a direction involved, when you exchange momentum with something, you can give it more momentum in the direction you're heading than you have. It's just a, a bigger exchange. And the consequence to you is that you end up with less than zero momentum in that direction, which is to say you're heading, you end up with momentum in the opposite direction. So if I go over to the wall and push on it hard, you know, I, I walk into the wall, um, I, I can transfer all of my momentum wallward and extra, in which case I end up with negative wallward momentum, which means I, I have momentum away from the wall. And this stuff happens all the time. Uh, the transfer process is, a, is an impulse, which is a force times time. And just for your own, you know, whether I ask you about it or not, uh, you can transfer the same momentum to something either with a big force for a short time or a small force for a long time. And you may care which of the two you're doing. If you're pounding a nail in, you want the transfer fast. If you're walking into a wall, you want the transfer slow. All right? Any questions about the, the early part of the semester? OK. Um, spring scales. So spring scales, I introduced the idea of a spring. The goal of the, the, the scale is to, is to determine the weight of something. And it does this by holding the something in equilibrium, supporting it with a spring, having gravity pull down on it, and making those two are equal, meaning that the, the object is sitting in equilibrium, zero net force and it's staying there. And at that point, then you look at the spring, because you know it's how hard it's pulling up, equal to the weight of the thing, of the object. And by looking at the stretch of the spring, you can figure out how, much it's, how hard it's pulling. Uh, later on with springs, we discovered that they are the, sort of the perfect force for establishing a stable equilibrium used by a harmonic oscillator. Harmonic oscillators, which we came to later with clocks, really, um, are systems that, are, that have a stable equilibrium. That's, that is, it, it's an equilibrium and one to which the object tends to return if you disturb it, because it, forces or other influences show up whenever you, whenever you bump something that's in a stable equilibrium and try to push it back. So you've got a stable equilibrium, and, and the force is spring-like, which is shorthand for saying the force changes uh, in proportion to, to how far you've displaced the thingamabob from equilibrium. So if you pull the, the thingamabob from equilibrium one unit of distance, you get one unit of force. You take it two units away in distance, you get two units of force. That's a spring-like restoring force, because that's how springs work. It's called Hooke's Law. Hooke's Law is, is the observation that, that springs push back on their ends in proportion to how far you've distorted the spring. And it's just most things, be, you know, lots of things behave that way. A stick behaves that way. There, my stick. Another prop. It, this is spring-like about its equilibrium. Anyhow, uh, so spring scales then, they're not really built to be harmonic oscillators. They're more built to, to weigh things. But they're using a spring to do it. And as a result, if they don't, if, if you don't uh, damp the bouncing out when you throw the melon in the, in the grocery scale, it bounces up and down as a harmonic oscillator. It fits all the rules. It bounces with a, with a period of motion that is independent of how big that motion is, which is one of the, the, the side effects of being a harmonic oscillator. Bouncing balls. Um, with bouncing balls, we looked at another sort of, well, I guess it's an oscillating system, but it's, 
uh, looking at, the, at, at how balls you know, from, game, from, from sports or whatever, how they interact with other objects. And they, and they hit and they store energy and they release the energy. To, they waste some of it. So the, the, the liveliness of a ball depends on its character, its ability to, to store energy during a denting process and, re, and return that energy during the undenting process. And so different balls bounce with different uh, efficiencies off of immovable, uh, rigid immovable surfaces. Uh, once you get the surface either not rigid or not immovable, life gets more complicated because now it's not just the ball that's doing the bouncing, it's the surface too. So if you have a particularly soft surface, it can do a lot of the denting, a lot of the energy storage, and therefore be responsible for a lot of the bounce. So you can have these strange situations where you take a very, uh, a ball that doesn't bounce well, for example, a baseball. Uh, it does not bounce very well. I mean, you happen to have one, right? Kind of, it's kind of crummy. But if you let it hit a surface that dents a lot, that, that really yields, you know, gives as, as the ball hits it, and receives a lot of the collision energy, and yet is very bouncy, the ball will come off fast. And so this, this for example, is, is why aluminum bats are different than wood bats. Wood bats, basically, it's like hitting cement. It doesn't dent much. But if you hit an aluminum bat, particularly one that's engineered to dent deliberately, it's like a trampoline. And so the ball, the baseball is, is less responsible for the bounce. The bat now stores energy well, returns it well, and, you, and the ball comes off faster. So you can hit it farther. It's, you know, it's, just, it's a different game. All right. Uh, if the surface is moving, of course, then, then the relative motion between the two matters. Uh, how fast the two are approaching each other is, is the is the key issue for, for figuring out how the bounce is going to work. And this comes about not only in, in balls bouncing off of bats or soccer ball bouncing off your leg, but in other objects hitting each other. So cars, for example, uh, bumping into each other. When they're, in rel when they're both moving, the approach speed matters. And so if you're both heading, if, if you get a, a bump when you're both heading the same direction, and the, 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 the rear car goes a little too fast and bumps into the car, it's a gentle bump because the relative speeds fall. Yeah, you're both traveling fast, but it's not much uh, between the two of you. On the other hand, head-on collision is much worse because now the, the approach speed's huge. And the bounce is, is, is nasty. All right? Um, carousels and roller coasters. This is the story of, the, of, of your experiences of acceleration. So it's one thing to talk about them from a inert perspective, just watch it passively, watching, them, watching things bump into each other. But if you're the object that's accelerating, you feel it. You feel, you feel the parts of your body uh, needing a force to, to, to undergo that acceleration. So if you want, if, when you are accelerating to the right, you feel all your viscera basically trying to exhibit inertia. They don't want to, if, if you're initially not moving, they're, gonna, they're trying to stay not moving. They need forces to make them move. And so if something comes up behind you and pushes you, all, all your parts need to be pushed to, as well. And the parts are pushed by each other. And you feel those stresses as an experience that's very gravity-like. It feels like weight, but it's not. It's a feeling of acceleration. And it does, it, the feeling does go opposite the acceleration. So if you accelerate to the right like crazy, you're in somebody's Tesla in ludicrous mode, and you hit the accelerator, oh, off you go. You feel super heavy-ish backwards during that forward acceleration. All right? Um, in the roller coaster, it can lead to weird things like when you're going over the loop-the-loop, -loop, you're accelerating downward faster than gravity alone would do. Um, that's, there's no problem. I, you know, I did this demonstration where I, where I went and chased a ball. You can actually throw a ball into the ground faster a faster acceleration than gravity will do. And if you do that sort of motion, even with this loop, I'm, I'm actually at the top of the loop, I'm pushing downward on the ball. It's actually accelerating downward faster than gravity alone would make it go. And that means I, I, at that moment, freeze frame, I'm actually pushing down on the ball. The ball is pushing up on me as it has to, Newton's third law. And so if that ball were you, you would be pressed into, and this is a seat, you'd be pressed into the seat. And because you're accelerating downward so fast, you feel this feeling of acceleration upward. 
that more than uh, balances out your experience of gravity. You actually feel a gravity-like sensation upward. And you feel pressed into your seat. You feel, even though you're upside down and all, but you feel like you're pressed into your seat and you're getting a gravity-like sensation upward. All right. Uh, bicycles. I mean, one of, the, one of the, the key points in bicycles was the idea of, of stable and unstable equilibria. Tricycle, when it's upright with a kid sitting on it and motionless, is in a stable equilibrium. It, it is actually a minimum of total potential energy. It, uh, any disturbance of the kid away from that, tip the, tip the tricycle, increases the total potential energy of the tricycle system and forces show up that push it back. So it, it tends to accelerate back to equilibrium when, when disturbed. So that's what makes it a stable equilibrium. It's great for, for a kid just sitting on the tricycle. Uh, bicycle has an unstable equilibrium at rest. You can get it upright and all with you sitting on it, but any disturbance away from that unstable equilibrium causes it, total potential energy to decrease. It's actually temporarily, it's at a maximum of total potential energy. Um, that's a little bit overstatement. But anyway, when you tip, it releases total potential energy. And forces show up that make you tip faster and further. And so unstable equilibria are, are by themselves a, a disaster. A, a pencil balancing on its point. They tend to tip over. Because any disturbance, over they go. Uh, so so you've got a tricycle seems great at rest. It's, Stable. A bicycle, terrible. At rest, it's unstable. It turns out when they're moving, other things show up that are inter you know, interesting and valuable. It turns out a bicycle is a better vehicle in motion. The tricycle is chronically dealing with inertia problems, trying to get the forces out of the ground to push the rider to the side when the rider turns. And, and tricycles, like cars, uh, if you turn them too fast, the forces that, that are exerted on the wheels to cause that acceleration in, in, of the turn, they can flip the, flip the vehicle over. If the vehicle isn't stable enough and, and there's not enough time, the vehicle basically gets its feet pulled out from under it, its tires pulled out from under it by friction, and the vehicle just rotates and tips over. So uh, bicycles can avoid that disaster, not by riding pure upright, but, but rather by, by deliberately leaning the bicycle during a turn. You're actually using your, the, the, the ability of, a, of an unstable vehicle to, to, to lean, to sort of partly fall, to get it, get it so that you're, you're, you're opposing two different effects against each other. One of them is that if you, on a bicycle, if you turn without leaning, you're no better than a tricyclist. And, the, and when you make that turn, the wheel pushes out from under you and you fall. And you fall towards, your head goes towards the outside of the turn if you don't lean. If you lean without turning, on the other hand, then you are experiencing torques due to, due to the support force from the ground on the wheels. And they rotate the, the, the bicycle to fall, make it fall over. And the way you fall in that case is in the direction you're leaning. So if you do both at once, you, you turn and you lean towards the inside of the turn, you can get those two effects to, to cancel. So you, so you stay upright. The whole, well, you stay, you, you, you don't rotate. You, you stay at that same lean and around you go. And this shows up in a bicycle, it shows up in a, in a running race. If you run around a loop track, every time you go on the loop, you don't stay purely upright. You will flip if you do. You have to lean towards the inside of the turn. So you're, you're balancing these two effects against off, each, uh, uh, off one another. OK? Uh, rockets and stuff. The key thing about rockets is their propulsion. How do they propel themselves? They use the conservation of momentum. They don't push on something outside the rocket. They push on something inside the rocket. It's fuel. They throw the fuel out one direction and let it carry away backward momentum and they end up with the, 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 uh, the other half, the, right, the forward momentum. Because the momentum that the rocket had to start with, this is setting aside gravity, 
is all it's got. It's got, you know, a rocket, in the absence of gravity, a rocket's got zero, mo zero momentum at the start. When, the, when everything's over, it's going to still have zero total momentum. But it's going to give that momentum, uh, it's going to distribute it funny. It's going to give the fuel this tremendous downward momentum. And it's going to end up with the, with the other half, tremendous upward momentum. And the process is gradual and has some complications. And gravity throws its uh, details in. But, but the basic idea is if you throw that fuel out fast enough backwards, you get a, a good propulsion forward. And you don't need anything out there to push against. You're pushing against the fuel. All right? Uh, once you get into space, you can start doing things like orbiting. And the, the story of the, of the orbit is just to you, you understand what things are doing when they're orbiting. They're in free fall. So an astronaut orbiting the Earth, at low Earth orbit, is they're, they're, they're 100, 200 miles up there. They're falling. And consequently, they feel the, the experience of acceleration opposite their acceleration. Upward, they feel weightless. They're not truly weightless. They have, they're almost the same weight you and I have, I mean, assuming we have the same mass. But what's different is, because they're only a little bit farther from the center of the Earth, the difference is they're, they're just falling. And as a result, they feel no, no sensation of weight. Everything's falling together. They don't feel, their viscera doesn't feel like it's supporting parts of the other viscera and stuff. The, 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 the fluids in their ears that, 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 get, that help you balance, those fluids are just floating around in the ear, in the, the, the ear canals. And they feel no experience of weight. It's a, a, a terrifying feeling for most of us. They're experiencing it the whole time they're, they're up there in orbit. Day after day after day, they can have it. Uh, the reason they don't hit the Earth, given that they're in free fall, is because they're going sideways, horizontally, so fast that as they make progress, as their velocity evolves to get closer to the Earth, the Earth curves away underneath them. So they sort of make no progress. They, they remain at the same altitude above, above the surface of the Earth because the Earth is curving just as they're curving. All right? Um, that'll do for rockets. Which takes us on into the world of fluids. I then went in to talk about how a balloon floats, uh, helium and or hydrogen. And then talked about how gases work. So gases are all these individual particles, either atoms or collections of atoms known as molecules. And um, e thermal energy is distributed among these particles. Uh, without thermal energy, all these particles would fall and under gravity and they would bounce around for a while and they eventually would settle on the, on the surface of the Earth and that would be that, it would be boring. But because there is thermal energy in these guys, they're bouncing around off each other. And in fact, they're traveling quite fast, hundreds of miles an hour uh, on average. It, it depends. The little guys, the ones with very small masses, go faster. Uh, but, they, but this bouncing process creates uh, pressure. It means that, that, that a gas, uh, when, it, when an object, when a solid object is immersed in the gas, the gas is bouncing its little particles off that solid object. And they, on average, create a force on that surface. And the force depends on how big the surface is. So we, we start talking, instead of talking about the force that the air exerts on a sheet of paper, you talk often about the force the air exerts on each square inch of the paper, which is a notion uh, described uh, called pressure. So gases exert pressure on things. And the pressure down here, at the sur near the surface of the Earth, is quite large in our, in our atmosphere. And why is it large? It's because of the weight of the atmosphere. It's gravity. If there were no gravity, there'd be no atmospheric pressure. It's, it's, a, it's a gravity effect that the air down here, it can't just sit on the ground because it's got thermal energy. But it can be squished down here and packed pretty tight by the weight of all the air going up to the top of the atmosphere. And how much weight is there over, a, say, a square meter of surface? It's about 100,000 newtons. And I know that because the atmospheric pressure down here is about 100,000 newtons per square meter. And that means that's the weight of, of, of that column of air going up over the square meter. And um, what else about that? Uh, because there's this high pressure down here, and it gets gradually less and less as you go up, by, by, because there's less weight overhead, there's a pressure gradient in the Earth's atmosphere. It's, that is a gradient being a, a continuous evolution of a physical quantity. 
So there's a, the pressure down here is high, a little less, a little less, a little less, a little less, and so on. And that gives rise to a buoyant effect in, in materials, anything immersed in the fluid, the air in this case. If you put a balloon in there, the balloon is being pushed up by this uneven pressure around it. The pressure down below is a little higher than the pressure above, and so there's a net upward push on the, on the balloon. And that's called the buoyant force. And the amount of the buoyant force is exactly equal to Archimedes' principle, exactly equal to the weight, that, uh, the weight of the air the balloon is, is displacing. If you take the balloon away, what was it displacing exactly? And so there's an upward push. And if you can make the balloon itself lighter than the air it's displacing, we'll go into, in a moment, I'll, I'll come to how to do that, there will be a net upward force on the balloon. It'll have a weight still, can't get rid of that. But the buoyant force upward will ex exceed the weight. And the two won't cancel. There'll be a net upward force in the balloon. How do you, so how do you make a balloon that's so, that's so light? Well, you either want to put very light particles in there, like helium, or you want to put very few particles in there, like hot air. So putting helium in there, in that balloon, instead of air, it turns out the number of particles inside the balloon will stay the same. That's, a, that's part of this ideal gas law story that I'll, I'll, I'll not go into. If there were a trillion and three air molecules in the balloon before, and you swap it for a helium balloon, there'll be a trillion and three helium atoms in there. Surprise, you know, it works out. Each helium atom is just as good at making pressure as an air particle. The difference is the helium atoms weigh so much less, a seventh of the average air molecule. And so you got a balloon full of light stuff. It does not weigh as much as the buoyant force uh, pushing up on it, and so off, up it goes. On the other hand, if you, take, if you have your air balloon, and it's at room temperature, and it's got a certain number of particles in there, a trillion and three, I think I said, and, or a zillion and three. If you then take that away and replace it with a balloon full of hot air, it doesn't have a trillion and three particles in it. It's only got maybe a half that. Depends on how hot you make it. Because now you've put more thermal energy in, every, in it. There's more thermal energy in every particle. It hits more often, it hits harder. And so it makes pressure more efficiently. You don't need as many of them in there. So now it's light because it has fewer particles. OK? That is a balloon story. Um, water distribution. So in water distribution, uh, the issue now was we shifted over to another fluid, water, uh, in contrast to air. Air is compressible. You can pack air more tightly, the, less tightly, and so on. You can change its density, its density, that is, the mass per volume. How, ma how, ma how many kilograms per cubic meter? Atmospheric pressure, air, here at room temperature, it's about, that box contains about one and a quarter kilograms of air. Water, you can't change its volume much. It's, it's said to be incompressible. So if you've got a box of, of a one, one meter box full of water, it, it's got a mass of about 1,000 kilograms, conveniently. And you can't do a thing about that. It's pretty much, that's the, that's the density of water, about 1,000 kilograms per, per uh, cubic meter. Um, so you put the water in, a, in plumbing, you start making the water move. How do you make it move? You make it move by ex exposing it to pressure imbalances. You, put, you have higher pressure at one end than at the other end, and now there's a net force on every portion of water. It it's accelerates towards the lower pressure. So this is sort of general theme of things, that gases and, and liquids tend to accelerate toward lower pressure. They don't necessarily move toward lower pressure. That's a, that's a velocity issue and momentum issue and inertia issue. The pressure balances are forces, in effect forces, and they cause accelerations. So that's just a general theme of, of things. Uh, the, the influences that cause, mo the forces and torques and stuff of the world cause accelerations. They don't cause velocities directly. They cause changes in velocity. All right, so, so I looked at, if you want to move water around, uh, if you, if you, particularly if you do it through, through stationary plumbing, you can start to, to see the motion in, in a fairly simple terms. A lot of it has to do with conservation of energy. That water in plumbing, or something plumbing-like, 
can have its energy in one of three forms or, or some mixture of the two. The three forms are gravitational potential energy by being up high, or kinetic energy by moving fast, or pressure potential energy, which is a little more messy, but, but basically the idea is water that's under a lot of pressure also has the ability to do work. So um, it's got energy uh, in it. And if you follow the water flowing through a stationary plumbing system and that, that it has been flowing steadily, and that it, in effect is, is flowing so nicely all together that you can't see the passage of time, that a, that a movie looks the same as a photograph. Then you have a situation that's known as steady state flow. And the other thing is to, 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 to ignore any possibility of viscosity. So, so, so it's, this is a perfect flow situation, steady state flow. Then you can watch the energy of the water, of every drop of the water along a particular path, what is known as a streamline, the path that this water drop will take and that all of its similar water drops will take along that streamline. You look at the energy, it's going to go back and forth between these three forms, and, and, but the sum will stay constant. So for example, when water flowing through one of these steady systems goes into a narrowing pipe, or anything that gets narrower, like a nozzle, it has to speed up to avoid a traffic jam problem. So it has to go from, from low speed at higher pressure to high speed at lower pressure. Um, that's true, certainly, if you, yeah. It, it, it's accurate. I, I try, I'm trying to get all the, the legal, cover ever, all the details. And it's not even the questions on the, pro, on the exam. I try very hard to get everything legally correct, but I, sometimes I, I, I stop giving you every detail because the questions would get so long. So what, what's going through my head in this, as an example, is, is when I said that the water goes from, through a pipe and it goes into a narrowing part of the pipe. What happens? It turns pressure potential energy into kinetic energy. What I didn't say was, is this pipe horizontal or vertical? If it's vertical, gravity's involved, and that's messy. And for the, for the purposes of this class and questions, sometimes I just leave those. Like, they're going through my head and going, oh, damn, I didn't mention that it's horizontal. Um, but you know, we're not publishing anything, and nobody's going to come and beat on us, OK? So you can cause the water to, 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 to turn pressure potential energy into kinetic energy by going through a narrowing. You can cause water to, to convert kinetic energy into gravitational potential energy by shooting it up as a jet, and, as a fountain jet, and, and things like that. OK. Um, you know, random observations that are worth noting is like, you know, why water towers? Well, it, you can store water in a variety of uh, places. A swimming pool is a perfectly good water storage device, right? Why, why not just have a pool? OK, the reason to go into a tower is because the water has two things. OK, water and energy. By putting it up high, you've packed it full of gravitational potential energy. It now can do things that water in a pool can't do. For example, as it descends out of that water tower to, to, to ordinary levels that, that, we, that we live on, it's going to convert its gravitational potential energy into either kinetic, if, it's, if the tower springs a leak, or if it comes down the pipe, it's going to turn it into pressure potential energy. And having a lot of pressure potential in energy in the water is useful in a, wa in a water delivery system. So that's why water towers. All right. Um, then the flow of fluids around things and in things. I talked about garden watering. Uh, in the context of garden watering, I started talking about the, the, the complexities of, of fluids, that they're not quite as simple as the garden, as the water distribution system uh, suggested. They have, for example, viscosity. Water rubs, layers of, of water and other fluids rub against each other and exert forces on each other as a result. Uh, that's, you know, it's more obvious in honey or, or molasses or something, syrups. Um, they don't move so easily, and that rubbing effect wastes energy just the way sliding friction wastes energy. It turns it into thermal energy. So that shows up. Um, fluid flow isn't always perfect. Where, where, the, where the flow of the water follows streamlines. Sometimes the streamlines get, get shredded apart by what's known as turbulence. 
So the streamlined flow is, called, is technically known as laminar flow. And in certain contexts, particularly when, when it, the fluid's inertia is really uh, dominating the flow, it, it shreds into a turbulent mess. And when that happens, you lose a lot of energy uh, in, in the fluid flow to thermal energy. So you can get turbulence around. What else? Uh, the, actually, and so turb turbulence, when inertia is dominating the flow around something, uh, the, the fluid's moving fast, it's going around big obstacles, and, and it's having trouble uh, sort of keeping orderly, it just shreds, the, then, then you get uh, turbulence. If the fluid is flowing slow and viscosity is really able to order things, it stays laminar. So inertia is the, is favors, inertia favors turbulence, uh, viscosity favors laminar flow, just as a general rule of thumb. Okay, uh, balls in air. Now when you, when we can take a moment to look at, at, the, at the airflow around any, you know, pick a ball. The, the flow as it goes around the ball, it can't go through the ball, so it has to bend away from the ball. And as it does that, it needs a pressure gradient to make it bend. A bend, bending airflow is accelerating. So something's pushing it, and the, something pushing it is, is a pressure gradient. And the gradient is such that the pressure has to be high where the, where the air first hits the ball. So there's a high pressure at the front of a ball where, where, the, where the air is rushing at it. The air bends away. The air bends toward the sides of the ball, uh, which is caused by low pressure at the sides of the ball. At the back of the ball is problematic. In the ideal flow situation, laminar flow, you'd get high pressure at the back of the ball as well. Uh, that never happens in, in ball sports in air because inertia wins and you get turbulence. The back of the ball is always turbulent. The back of, of, of ordinary size objects, us for example, uh, moving through air at any ordinary speed, the air never manages to get its act together to go around the sides and re reform beautifully as laminar flow all the way. It never does it. So you always end up with turbulence back there. So, the, so a bicyclist has turbulence behind them. A car has turbulence behind uh, the car. A bird has turbulence behind the bird. Um, That said, okay, you know, we, my, my thought process again is the bird. The birds are, birds are engineered by evolution to leave as little turbulent wake behind them as possible, just like an airplane, although an airplane didn't do it by evolution. Um, what else? Okay, so, uh, so the, the, for, for ball sports, a lot of the issue in, in, in sending balls through the air is, is sort of controlling the, the, the motion of the ball in the face of this, of this, these, of this uh, turbulent air pocket behind the ball. It's a long way of saying what? All ball sport balls are experiencing a lot of what's known as pressure drag as they move through the air. The pressure drag comes about because the, the high pressure at the front of the ball is not canceled by a high pressure at the back of the ball. It's, there's a turbulent mess at the back of the ball, and so balls get pushed, they experience a net downwind force the force of air resistance, you normally would call it. It's technically pressure drag. And that's as opposed to viscous drag, which is experienced by, well, by everything, but, but it's not very important for balls uh, in the air. So um, that's probably good enough. OK. Um, the airplane, airplane uses very carefully, uses the the, the bending of air flows and stuff to, and the control of turbulence to do a couple things. One is that it, it deflects the airstream down. So the air come, come, coming, rushing at the plane by virtue of the shape of the wings and the tilt of the wings, and to some extent the body of the plane itself, it manages to take the air that was coming at the plane essentially horizontally. Yes, you could say the plane was moving through the air, but, equivalent, but from the perspective of the people in the plane, it's the air moving at the plane. It's just a, it, there are just differences of perspective, frame of reference. So the air is coming at the plane horizontally, and the plane deflects it downward, giving it downward momentum. And the result is the plane gets upward momentum out of that air. And that upward momentum poured into the plane by the air cancels the downward momentum that gravity gives the plane. The plane, basically, gravity's yanking the plane downward. The air is pushing the plane upward. They cancel the plane, flies at level, level flight. Um, 
getting all that to, to work involves bending the airflow in different directions on the top of the wings and the bottom of the wings. Uh, the plane is engineered to be aerodynamically streamlined. It tries to keep the airflow from going turbulent as much as possible. So it leaves as little a turbulent wake behind it as it can. This is my little aside about the birds. Birds do the same thing. I mean, fish, uh, dolphins, you know, the, the, the control of the, of the fluid flow so it doesn't go turbulent is, is amazing. Okay, they're very good at, at leaving a little wake as possible. People, not so good. Um, that's good enough for, for, for uh, airplanes. I, propulsion is, I'll leave that. Uh, heat, the story of heat. Yeah, I'm running out of time, of course. Um, you, when heat flows naturally from hot things to cold things, uh, that's a, it's driven statistically it's by the law of entropy, ultimately, that things uh, go, to, go to maximize, they, they want to increase the randomness. And so heat flowing from hot to cold does that. Uh, it goes by three mechanisms, the three famous mechanisms. Conduction, which is the transfer of heat through a material. The material's not moving, but the heat is working its way through the material from hot to cold. Uh, convection is heat moving in the material. So you actually have a material that can move, like water or air. Now you can put heat into the thermal energy into the air and let the, the air move. And that's, it's a heat flow, but it's heat flow in a material, not through a material. The material's moving too. And then thermal radiation is the, is the great mysterious one. It's, it's, it's light and all its friends, all the electromagnetic waves. And it turns out that objects uh, at any, with any thermal energy, they're emitting and they're going to be emitting thermal radiation. It's in the infrared, typically, for things at this temperature, ordinary temperatures. But it's there. You can see it with, with modern technology. And you certainly can feel the exchange of heat, uh, even if you can't see it. By, by radiation. Uh, clothing, uh, water, steam, and ice was the, the, the phase transitions between these various materials, and, the, and this typical of all materials. Uh, the takeaway there is that the, the world's a very active place on the microscopic uh, level. Atoms and molecules are coming and going from your skin, for example, all the time. And if you have just two simple uh, things, water in one phase, maybe it's steam. What are another phase? Maybe it's ice. There's an exchange of molecules all the time. And if the exchange is set up such that more leave one of those phases than, than leave the other, you're going to shrink the phase that they're leaving from at the ex and, and grow the phase that uh, they're, they're going to. So this is how you get evaporation or condensation of steam onto a surface or um, melting ice into water. Uh, climate, I told you this, this uh, just, I'll jump right to climate, the, the idea that, that the reason that, that we're have a, a increasing te average temperature of the Earth's surface is because in the balance of, of thermal energy coming in and going out of the Earth, which is entirely by radiation, the sun is sending heat in by, thermal, by, by its thermal radiation, which is visible light, primarily. And the Earth is getting rid of thermal radiation out into space which is primarily by infrared light. The source of that infrared light from the Earth is not exclusively the Earth's surface. Some of it's the Earth's surface, but a lot of it involves the atmosphere. And as we make the atmosphere darker and darker in the infrared, we, raise, we, we shift the effective source of, of the Earth's thermal radiation to higher and higher altitude above the ground. And by pushing that radiation surface upward, we leave more distance between it, which is at minus, I think, 18 Celsius, and the surface of the Earth, which is higher in temperature by about 6.6 .6 degrees per kilometer. So as that surface goes up, there's more distance for the temperature to rise before getting down to, the, to where we live, and we get warmer down here. So it's, this is going to be one of the big issues of your, of your lifetimes, is dealing with that increasing temperature. And with more thermal energy, I guess a good way to stop with this is, so I didn't get to um, the world of harmonic oscillators, and I didn't get much for thermodynamics. But, the, but the, one of the key observations of thermodynamics, the air conditioners and heat and, and the air automobile world, the, the movement of heat and the controlled movement of heat, as the Earth's surface gets hotter and hotter, there's more hot stuff around, or greater temperatures, 
the, great out, the, 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 the space is still bitter cold, so we've got uh, we've got hot things and cold things, and as that temperature difference gets bigger, there's, it's all thermal energy, but there is more opportunity to convert some of that thermal energy into work as the heat flows from hot to cold. And this was the idea of a heat engine. A heat engine lets heat flow from hot to cold and diverts some of it within the law of, of entropy. Uh, it's allowed to do that. It converts some of it into work. So it starts with purely thermal energy, but unevenly distributed, which is in itself an orderly thing. If it's uneven distribution, that's not the most random possible. You can, do, you, you can make it more random. So, so it turns something into work. And automobiles do this. They take the hot burn gas, and they take the cold outside air, and they let heat flow from one to the other, and they divert some and make, it, make your car go. Wind does this too. It takes a hot spot on the Earth's surface and a cold spot on the Earth's surface and lets heat flow from the hot spot to the cold spot and turns some of it into work, moving the winds. And as the temperatures get more extreme, the, the energy available for these winds and things like winds are, is going to get bigger. So, so it might not be the right time to go into the insurance business, uh, things like that. Okay, so with that, then I'll stop and I'll see you guys on the final. Thanks.